Hi, I'm Alma from the US-UK team here at Blick Rothenberg, and I'm here today with Matt and Inga to talk about year-end planning. So, Matt, Inga, as we come to 31st December, what things are we to consider for year-end planning? So, year-end planning is really crucial for our uh, US client base, so US persons who are living abroad. Um, in our examples, we tend to use um, US people living in the UK. Um, the reason we need to consider year-end planning is um, all around foreign tax credits so ensuring because the US tax year runs on a calendar year basis and the UK year runs on a 6th of April to 5th of April year basis we need to ensure that our clients don't have a shortfall in foreign tax credits on their US tax return and uh, as we'll explain there's various baskets that get picked up in terms of UK tax payments and where they go on their US return but essentially what we're trying to do is mitigate any double potential double tax exposure here and there's a lot of potential implications uh, if you don't which we'll um, touch on later. Um, it's um, as Matt mentioned we have um, also a um, double tax agreement between US and UK which tells us basically which credits we can claim in which country um, what income we can we, which income can get a credit um, it's all very nice and helpful however the practicalities of it actually claiming a credit it's more complicated so that's why we need to be always proactive and think what needs to be done so for example the main main consideration to everyone is if you you have some untaxed income at source, untaxed income during calendar year, we need to think if you need to prepare UK tax credit, uh, taxes. For example, if you're self-employed, if you are partner in a partnership, if you received some pension income, for example, social security or any type of other pension in US, and even if your form uh, shows tax withholding, um, it does not always mean it's correct. So if you are resident in UK on a rising basis, UK has a primary taxing right to tax uh, US pension income. So what you have to do, you have to prepay UK taxes in December, so to make sure you have enough credit on US return, and US will refund the withholding to you. So it's so important, um, otherwise you can barely be double taxed. Also, if you have investment income, like interest or dividends, again, most likely UK has a primary uh, taxing right, depending, uh, there are some circumstances different, but mainly, um, even if you have withholding on that investment income in US, again, it does not mean it's correct. It's possible that you need to prepay UK tax and just claim a refund from US. So really, people should be speaking to their tax advisor before 31st December. Correct. Because as you said, there's various types of income and capital gains that could be subject to double tax as a US person, a US person being a citizen, green card holder or resident. Yes. So we're not talking about people that are filing US tax returns as a non-resident. Um, we've got other investment income, purely people who are being double taxed. Absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's 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 individuals who are being ta uh, doubly taxed or, or subject to uh, a tax in both jurisdictions, whether or not, depending on how they file. But uh, as Inga points out, determining the, how the treaty um, taxes various types of income is really important. So determining what what type of income it is and who gets the primary taxing right will really um, drive any year end tax payments that need to be made. Uh, so that does need to be considered carefully. Uh, a key one that we always consider when we um, look with our clients into year in planning is capital gains, for example. Uh, this year being a um, particularly interesting year because we've had a change and increase in capital gains from, from uh, end of October. Um, there is, you know, uh, for example, we need to ensure that we've paid or taxpayers have paid a UK tax on any capital gains by the end of 31st December so they can pick that up and claim against a credit on their US return. The issues that you can come across with that, for example, are, you know, we have to use spot rates when we convert. So potentially you could have a USD loss uh, on realized investments, but actually that translates to a GBP gain. So considering those tax implications, um, also- um, Sale of a home, private sale residence. Of a home. Yeah, so, and that's a big one. Sale of a home is a really good example because sale of a home, again, that goes back to the treaty, back to Inga's point, because you then need to determine whether property is located for example and if it's in the UK absolutely you need to consider payment of that uh, and timing of that um, and then also the types of investment that you're selling you know and so if you're selling uh, securities for example funds 
you know, are they going to get the same tax treatment in the UK as they are in the US, for example? Are they offshore income gains or are they just straight subject to capital gains tax rates? All these are considerations that we need to take into account. So we're talking about income and gains that don't have any taxes withheld. But as an employee, I might also have taxes withheld um, via PAYE, but I should still have a discussion with my tax advisor because there could be times, especially if I've just come to the UK, yeah. where I'm not at the correct tax rate and I should actually be taxed a higher rate in the UK yeah. and have a mismatch. Absolutely. Your point, your example there is a great example of what we see a lot with our clients is if they're moving to the UK is uh, uh, there is suddenly becomes a UK tax exposure but obviously throughout the US calendar year and the UK tax year there's going to be a a difference and it's 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 crucial to ensure that yeah they're, they're thinking about it and even if as you say they're just on employment income eight times out of ten perhaps we would say there's there's something to consider and actually really year in planning is really important for anyone that's just come to the uk because you might not even have a utr which is a unique tax reference so making that payment physically to hmrc by 31st december might be difficult needs to be mm. planned in advance to register with hmrc get that code and then make that check or transfer to hmrc in absolutely time. Yeah, and the the waiting times to get to get a UTR application in the UK do are, are long. So yeah, that's a really good point. Having to wait for that, get the um, submissions done, and then also just thinking about how your US tax return is going to be impacted. You know, you have two taxes taxing jurisdictions which need to interact with each other. So we just had the UK budget, which outlined a lot of changes for UK people. How does that affect US people in year end planning? Great, um, great point, Elmer. So the first one to consider perhaps is the increase to capital gains tax rates. So where clients are taking advantage of getting the lower rates prior to the budget, something perhaps that they consider for year end planning is utilizing their losses or utilizing losses post 30th of, uh, 30th of October to ensure um, that there's um, a, a, a net US, uh, a lower net US tax exposure. Anything else that was done pre 30th October that we might want to consider? So clients may have considered um, some pension planning and, and taking out a pension lump sum distribution, for example, where clients have taken out pension income distributions, uh, we'd always advise that they consider getting tax advice on that and making sure that, again, they have sufficient foreign tax credits to offset against their US tax return. So I think that's probably the biggest difference this year, right? We're going to have to consider UK tax payments if necessary for pension distributions, capital gains distributions pre 30th of October yep. and how the tax might change post 30th of October. Absolutely, absolutely. It's going to be a year uh, for capital gains. It's going to be a year where there's a split of capital gains rates, of course, and then how we plan that into year end planning. But also, as you say, there's other points like pension income um, and that that links in quite nicely to clients who are on, for example, the remittance basis of taxation, which will be and jumping ahead um, here is is with the budget there was the non-dom proposals so considering how those changes are now going to impact our clients from 6th of april 2025 um, so this so 24 25 tax year will be the last year clients can claim the remittance basis so clients may wish to consider how they can do that uh, and various tax planning opportunities if people need to make a pay remittance basis charge uh, probably it's advisable to do it before year end also, um, if you have some offshore income or gains or want to realize some offshore income or gains, it's not so much for year and planning point, but probably for UK tax year ending, um, ending point before 5th of April, you may want to realize those gains um, or get trust distributions, for example, while you still can claim remittance basis. So you can use that uh, for those transitional rules suggested in the budget, 6th of April 25, um, flat rate of 12% on remitted income, offshore income. So that's quite good planning point, um, obviously not for December, um, but you can start thinking and taking into account all those losses and gains. Do you want to do something before 5th of April? Also, if you this calendar, if you already remitted some kind of income to the UK, again, this um, this is important for year and planning December 2024. Maybe you need to prepay some taxes in UK to make sure the credit is available on US return. For example, if you, even you got a trust distribution from a grant or trust in US, where grant or is subject subject to all the taxes in US, potentially grant or may claim a credit. But it the timing is so important. That's why we say think about it now. The timing because if we miss 
those rules if a miss if a gap is too uh, too big between the income arising and payment into the uk you, you may not be able to claim a credit um also um a very important trust distributions do you want to um limit it now do you want to keep them uh, offshore if you can claim, can claim remittance basis all those small things to think about so i guess the key point with the non-dom changes apart from the capital gains tax rates is if you're looking at remittances you might want to post postpone remitting yes. until 6th of april where you can take advantage of the 12 percent repatriation yeah. rates rather than 45 percent or whatever now yeah but okay. you probably need to think if you now if you actually claim a remittance basis for current uk tax year um, what income or gains you're generating or trust distributions you're obtaining to, make, to, be, to be able um, to have something in your pot to remit after 6th of April. If you realize those gains and losses after 6th of April, you're on a rising basis. There's no planning. It's going to be taxed as it arises. So this is what you'd start thinking now. Yep. And it's a very good point because also it, it ties into considering these new rules are part of the non-DOM process and whether they're actually relevant and apply. So, you know, there's, there's a whole host of new rules that... Um, may apply to some clients and may not apply to others depending on how long they've been yeah. in the UK for example um, and, and to Inga's point about timing uh, the remittance basis charge is a, is a great planning point in terms of perhaps uh, advancing your payment to 31st December again aligning it with the US tax year um, to ensure you've got credits. And we know that we had lots of changes in respect of trust so maybe it's time now to review your trust deeds um, just to determine the status for UK tax purposes so you know how it's going to be taxed after April or you know if you take a distribution now um, what's going to happen um, it's just very convenient time just don't leave it till the last minute so as always talk to your tax advisor yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah so we should we should also mention about being able to you know if you do miss your uh, year-end payments and you have a shortfall in foreign tax credits there is still the ability to claim carry back any excess credits from the following year the only issues with that is it creates a timing issue and potential cash flow um, shortfall because you have to uh, as well as as well as professional fees you'll have to um, do your 20 for example 2025 US tax filing and then any excess credits then carry back to your 2024 return on an amended return but it is possible to if you have got a shortfall to carry back but that only applies for one year only right? one year so yeah, for absolutely. the 2024 tax year and i realize again 30th of october 2024 that's due what my 24 25 tax return not due until 31st january 2026 what happens if i pay my uk tax on 31st january 2026 but i'm taxed in the us on 2024 so absolutely in that example as you say we can only carry back one year so then you do lose out and you have a double tax exposure that's a proper double tax yeah. exposure and that's permanent so, isn't it um, yeah it's permanent we can't fix it so this is this is why it's important if you if it happened december october november your uk tax due is only 2026 january so um those things need to be considered i guess also though if you have carry forward credits from previous years yeah. especially if you're living in the uk and you've got a higher uk tax rate on employment income for example taxed at 45 percent compared to 37 percent in the us that might help you with year end planning because you have that credit to offset absolutely that's a really good point um and and something that perhaps um advise uh, clients aren't aware of or taxpayers aren't aware of sometimes is that there are also different baskets depending on what income and gains they have so they might have or might think that they have a large basket of carryovers but that might be in a specific basket and if they're realizing gains for example that might fall under uh, would fall under a different basket i think this is what i mentioned at the beginning is double tax agreement tells you can claim a credit but yeah. those rules different baskets and and foreign tax with following income in that basket uh, technically may not allow you to do that so that's why all this year land planning is so important so what else do we need to consider as we get to 31st december um, very important part for a lot of clients is gifting, um, estate planning, obviously. So there are a few very easy bits. Um, gifting um, an basically annual exemption of $18,000 or gift splitting between husband and wife. They can do um, double that amount. It works quite well with gifts out of surplus income in the UK. So we can think about both things. Um, in UK, we need a little bit of evidence. It's actually surplus income, but it can 
work quite well um, in conjunction. Um, also, um, lifetime uh, gift and estate exemption of 13.61 uh, million, which with Trump winning probably may not go down. Um, again, if you want to make substantial, substantial gifts, reduce your estate for HD tax purposes, we can do that before a year end if you haven't done it yet. And I guess with that gifts out of excess income, it doesn't always have to be out, out of excess income, right? Like for UK tax purposes, if I just make a gift over 18,000, I just would like to survive seven years yes. yeah. and then it's still yeah. outside of my estate. Yes, obviously, yeah. uh, that's absolutely right. Um, but if you can make it work with surplus income, even better, even better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, don't forget about um, gifts to non-US spouse. Uh, 185k I believe this year again if you want to pass some assets to your spouse uh, not your spouse it's quite useful exemption is there anything else to consider about gifting yeah well on, on uh, the track of gifting um, charitable donations so uh, there are dual qualifying US and UK charities out there for example the charities aid foundation or donor advised fund um, these are uh, opportunities for taxpayers to get a, a deduction on both the uk tax side but also the us tax returns potentially so there's a dual qualifying aspect there um, so we certainly should consider those as part of year-end planning uh, there are also various educational institutions i believe which you can get the deduction for as well but in that case we want to make sure that it is actually registered in both jurisdictions and then you get the deduction Am I able to get that deduction all the time or does it depend on the amounts I give and how it compares to my income? Yeah, so that's a very good point. So from uh, exactly right. So from a UK standpoint, it's relatively a bit more simple in terms of you'll get relief for the gross donation made and it will extend your, your bands. But potentially, if you're a basic rate taxpayer, you won't get any additional relief. From a US tax standpoint, it is subject to restrictions and you're subject to 60% of your AGI on your uh, donation. And that all gets calculated and worked out and comes through on uh, as part of your deductions, which um, you can either, if you choose to claim, you can choose to claim on the US side either standard deduction or an itemized deduction. So the standard deduction is just a set amount deduction that you can claim depending on your filing status and doesn't factor in any charitable donations or state tax paid or anything um, like that. Um, but if your itemized deductions are higher, you obviously will want to claim those. So you can. Uh, opt to claim those and that's when your charitable donations and um, uh, state tax payments for example will be deductible uh, potentially mortgage interest up to a certain point but uh, your state tax um, is restricted to ten thousand dollars at the moment so you really want to be considering state i'm sorry itemized deductions versus standard deduction depending on your income levels i guess like you want to maybe contribute to a charity in a high income year and then also think about going back to the standard deduction in the lower income year to maximize the deduction that's available or at least not absolutely, waste it. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's really good tax planning uh, generally is to, as you say, optimize your position for where, for whatever income you've had for that year. So as you say, if you have a high income year looking to really maximize your charitable donation in that year uh, is, is, is really beneficial if you are going to make it. So you mentioned cash donations and the 60% limit. What happens when you contribute stock to a charity? So stock and securities are restricted to 30% of your AGI, so there is there is a lower limit there in terms of restriction. But the benefit is um, you are moving it out of capital gains tax. So that is also a very good year-end planning. And yeah. actually we saw quite a few clients um, deciding to do that because of the increase in UK capital gains tax rate after the budget. So what people deciding is I would rather give that stock to um, charity and not pay, not realise a capital gain in my name. Like you actually raised a really good point though so like is that a uk thing as well yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. you do both um and i had clients uh, actually contacting us saying if i just give up the stock i don't want to pay that 24 percent or the people thought maybe be higher mm. um 24 it's still quite good increase not, not such a huge increase some people expect yeah. it but then when it was um rumors going around of 39 percent people said i will just give that um asset to a charity so i don't need to realize again and that's probably um, really interesting sorry matt let's go ahead. <laughs> that's what really interesting if we're talking about 24 percent in the uk on capital gains compared to 20 percent in the us whereas if you just gift it we're talking about zero percent and yeah, you don't get need to worry about the increased rate and you get a charitable donation and hopefully you can get both in the us and uk if you use right 
track. Do they? So you'd really want to time the donation to make sure that it's in the same calendar year, just like you would a UK tax payment. As long as you do it before 31st December, you've got a nice match with yeah. the UK and US. Yeah. Well, if you're on the crude basis of tax? You're, you're restricted if you're on the crude basis in terms of planning, just because, as, as a quick recap on the cruise basis, for the US tax year, you're not picking up um, UK or any non-US tax payments when you pay them, which is where the potential planning opportunities come in. You're more just picking them up on the year to which you are, if, to take the UK, for example, the fiscal year, so up to 5th of April, and you can only really pick up the tax liability for that year. So there's less uh, flexibility in terms of your you planning payments. But we can, still, we can still plan stuff. Yep. Um, because the, the accrued basis means that your liability accrues on 5th of April. Um, in the US, we say so-called um, all events test, so everything happened to accrue for that liability um, in April. So if you realize again, let's say in January in that calendar year, um, we, can, we can still work with that. Um, it's, it's more restricted, but we can still work with that. Yeah, I guess you're kind of beholden to your UK tax liability each year if you go on the crude basis. But yeah. actually, sometimes being on the crude can help. Can, yeah. Mm -hmm. can. If you haven't paid that. And, it, and it's worth tax. noting as well that once you're on the accrued basis, you, you it's can't. irrevocable. You can't go back to the paid basis. So it, it's definitely one not to take lightly. But as you say, it could be a good planning point, um, but it needs to be considered carefully. Yeah, a very extreme measure, but could help you, I guess. Yeah. So we've talked about a lot um, when it comes to year-end planning and there's various things to consider. If there was one thing you could ask clients to do before 31st December, what would it be? Um, I would say not only before 31st of uh, December, always give us as much notice as possible. Give your tax advisor plenty of time before you're making a transaction, before you're taking a distribution or realizing anything. Um, ask a question before taking a step. Um, just because something may be completely common sense to you um, actually can be more complicated than it is. So that's talking about future between now and 31st December? Yes, and even in this context, now I think in this context of changes, even before 5th of April. And Matt, what about you? I'd reiterate what Inga said and, and, and say the US-UK tax world is notoriously complex. Um, don't be afraid contact your tax advisors and they can discuss it with you but also don't assume that it's going to be okay because there are such levels of complexity around it it is absolutely worth making sure that you're um, considering all the tax implications or maybe even if it is okay if you contact your um, tax advisors it can be a lot better okay so a lot to consider then but talk to someone and we'll we'll be happy to help so there's a lot to consider when it comes to year-end planning and we've covered a lot of the main topics. Matt, Inga, thanks a lot for that. If we can help in any other way when it comes to your year-end planning, feel free to give myself, Matt or Inga a call at Blick Rothenberg and we'll be very happy to help.